Good afternoon to all. This is Milt Rosenberg. And, of course, we have changed our schedule somewhat in response to what's been happening uh, in Paris and around the world. And uh, we will be talking about the war, if that's what you want to call it. Uh, And we'll be talking about that in studio with uh, both Barry Kelman and John uh, Allen Williams. Uh, Jay Williams is an old friend, professor of political science at Loyola. Uh, Barry Kelman turns out is an old student of mine, or so he tells me. He once got a, an undergraduate degree at the University of Chicago, <coughs> went on to get a law degree, and is professor of law and director of International Weapons Control Center at DePaul University. Um, and later on, we're going to be joined um, via phone by Daniel Greenfield, um, a, an Israeli columnist who is a <coughs> fellow uh, at... Um, a few American think tanks, and uh, has been following the rise of militant Islam for uh, quite some time. And then by the great Victor Davis Hanson, who is too complicated to introduce in just a few summary words, but is a friend of this program and one of the best analysts any of us knows when it comes to both national and international (coughs) politics. All of that said, gentlemen, and by that I refer to Messrs. Kelman and Williams, Look at two presidents, Uh, one of them an avowed socialist, the other, it seems to me, in some ways a functional one, uh, the president of France and the president of the United States. Uh, They take somewhat different views of the recent troubles uh, or the latest phase in the continuing troubles between the Islamic world or a portion thereof and the West. Uh, And President Hollande has said this is a war. France is now at war with Islam or rather with a sector of Islam, which won't go away, which must be killed and defeated. Our president still talks about containment, as does his former Secretary of uh, State, and indeed just an hour before the announced attack in Paris (coughs) was bragging just a little bit that we had uh, achieved another step of containment by the execution of uh, Jihadi John, so-called. I put it to both of you quite simply, quite directly. Are we at war? And if not full war, uh, what do you call, what's the proper vocabulary for the situation we are in? Well, I think, first of all, with regard to President Obama, I I would prefer the sobriquet law professor. And I would ask him as a law professor, why are we not considering this as a massive crime against humanity? Which is exactly what it is. There is no question but that these are Mass numbers of innocent people have been killed. This is a criminal organization, and it needs to be eradicated. That is, hopefully by arrest, but that may be fanciful. And if fanciful, then they need to be killed. Does it need to be er eradicated following the vehicles of law and using federal indictment and federal courts? I would I would prefer that they go to the International Criminal Court and get an indictment. This is, again, this is an international rather than, crime. Rather than just wage a war. Yes. Which is simpler. Right. Well, it's, doesn't re- it's not a question of complexity. It's a question of authority. And the authority should be that of arresting, if possible, and if not possible, killing people who have committed mass crimes against humanity. But at the time of, of, the, of the Nazi war, we didn't set as a possible goal arresting Adolf Hitler. It was kill him and kill all of his minions. Yes, and Yamamoto also, as we, he was flying around New Guinea. Um, Trotsky said that uh, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you, and we can call it whatever we want. Uh, it's not a declared war. We haven't done that since December of 1941, but the president can make war. And effectively, what, we're doing, what we are doing is, in fact, war-making. There's a, for various reasons, he doesn't want to call it a war on Islamic extremism, uh, and I'm actually content to leave the religious element out of it. Ah, well, now I have one clip I want you to hear. Uh, It it, uh, was released just this morning. He may have recorded it yesterday or earlier this morning, namely Senator Rubio. And here's what he says about the situation we are presently in. The attacks in Paris are a wake-up call. A wake-up call to the fact that what we're involved in now is a civilizational conflict with radical Islam. This is not a geopolitical issue where they want to conquer territory and it's two countries fighting against each other. 
They literally want to overthrow our society and replace it with their radical Sunni Islamic view of the future. This is not a grievance-based conflict. This is a clash of civilizations. For they do not hate us because we are, have military assets in the Middle East. They hate us because of our values. They hate us because young girls here go to school. They hate us because women drive. They hate us because we have freedom of speech, because we have diversity in our religious beliefs. They hate us because we're a tolerant society. This is a clash of civilizations, and either they win or we win. There you have a very strong statement from an aspirant to the American presidency that Islam itself is making war. Sure, he will. Well, he, didn't, he didn't say that. He didn't say. He's that. saying it follows from Islam. That well, he this he's conflict. saying that. Well, I, in any event, I want to disagree with Senator Rubio <laughs> only to the extent of referring to this as a civilizational clash, because I think to attribute to to ISIL, it is a civilization, is to give it far, far too much credit. This is a very large band of of criminals. Well, I think it hangs uh, on quantitative uh, data that we don't really have. The question is, how many in the total world of Islam, which numbers about, what, 1.2 billion people in no, the world I... at the moment? Hmm. Um, or 1.3 billion thereabouts. How many uh, in that world not are ready to pick up arms and wear suicide vests and uh, kill themselves to kill us, but how many welcome it or find it rather agreeable that this is happening? How much implicit support is there in the world of Islam for what the, quote, radicals have undertaken? Well, if you're only a small percentage of a, of a population that's that large is radicalized, that poses a problem, whether you want to call it geopolitical or, or whatever. Uh, but there's also been a, a response by— you're like, the, you're like the echo of Sam Huntington? Clash of civilizations? Well, I think it's an interesting way to look at things, but of course he got flame sprayed by uh, academics and others who thought this was just over the top. I would have been just as happy if he hadn't written the article, Jose, can you see? I think that kind of trivialized it a bit. But I think there is something to say that the basic approaches toward the world and how values and how we think about the role of, of you know women and uh, politics and what have you, I think there are some great differences. But what is going on is, in fact, a war. Whether you want to call it a war of civilizations or not, it doesn't matter. I think I differ with Barry a little bit as to the priority of, of turning something over to the United Nations involving the use of force, and particularly the International Criminal Court, which we have never joined and probably never will. I think that's a non-starter. You are a, by now, retired uh, captain in uh, the Naval Reserve. You've done a lot of active uh, naval time. Uh, on shipboard at the Naval War College, etc., and your basic area in when it comes to military affairs uh, has been strategy, the waging of wars and how you do it. Uh, what is the strategic situation that the West uh, faces at the moment? Well, if you if someone is at war with you, it's as well that you know it ahead of time. Uh, that this attack occurred could not really have been a surprise, maybe only in the timing and location, but after Mumbai uh, in India, the attack, which was nothing to do with uh, uh, with uh, Al Qaeda or any of these groups, uh, this is a very, very easy and effective way to de to destabilize and, and terrorize a society. But, but the what's the what's the, what is the strategic challenge to the West? How does the West handle this from here on? Well, it, or should it? There's really well, we need absolutely we need to take this dead seriously. Uh, whether that means we put American troops on the ground, which we can we will I'm sure talk about later in the in the program. Yeah, is a is very contentious, but we need to be aware of what we are facing, and it is a very very serious challenge, and it'll be a challenge of long standing that we need to take very seriously. May May I ask my my colleague what what does the word war get you? What 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 does use of the term allow or authorize or enable that couldn't be authorized or enabled? Without the word, it seems to me that it's a it's an intentionally inflammatory word. That anything we we need to do, we can do pursuant to legal authority, and we can stand for the rule of law, and we can recognize that this is a global threat. It's not just a threat to the United States. So while we haven't joined the International Criminal Court, most countries in the world have. And it is an available way to legitimize the use of force. 
And then we have to talk about, as you said, we have to talk about the use of force. Yeah. And, and, but I'm not sure what the word war gets us. Well, doing, it the, way, us. doing it the way you suggest does, for one thing, slow the process of response considerably, does it not? Yeah, no. and, and I'm not, pre well, uh, Barry, I'm not ready to turn the legitimization of the use of force over to the United Nations. That's not, that's not a good idea. Uh, and the, using well, the word war does not mean that you have to have a non-law-based uh, way in which you fight the war. Well, you may not be willing to turn the, the, the question of authorization over to the United Nations, but I would argue that the United Nations Charter has already taken that question, and we are members of the United Nations Charter, and it provides for going to the Security Council when there's a threat to international peace and security. So it may not be politically to your liking or to someone else's liking, but it is international law, the most fundamental international law. Well, you know, that, ru that rubs my mind the wrong way. Well, the issue uh, is One whether... of the reasons it does is that I can imagine uh, not the Security Council, but the General Assembly uh, putting out a vote in which they agree it is a matter of war and it's, and it's a war fomented by... And for which well, the General um, Assembly doesn't have authority. I know, but I'm yes, out, but right. And I have a rhetorical point to make. They're going to blame it on Israel. Many of those nations. Well, yeah, sure. I think, I think we're well, a little far fetched. The problem with the Security Council is that if you turn if you turn the decision of the use of U.S. use of force and our national interests over to that organization, where various nations have vetoes in it. Uh, you are going to you're going to be unilateral disarmament. I wouldn't do that in a oh, million oh, years. Excuse me, excuse me. There's just simply no evidence of this. If we can point to Bush 41 and his response to uh, Saddam Hussein's taking over of Kuwait, going to the Security Council, getting a resolution, establishing a multilateral force in response to the to that, and repelling Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Now, what I'm saying, the, in this case, it's really hard to see how France would object to, to a resolution condemning ISIL. It's really hard to see how Russia would object in view of the, the plane crash last week. China, but Britain. Would you, would you want those nations to wait in, before they make any aggressive response until they get UN confirmation? I think the question of timing... I mean, France we, is we responding right now. No yeah. one is it moving in the work. next 24 <laughs> hours. The, the, the notion that this is somehow that we have to emergency respond... We are not we are not responding as if it's an emergency. Perhaps well, the we should. They're bombing the heck out of Raqqa right well, now. They're, they're, yes, they're bombing one or two towns. And by the way, Bush did that not because he was hoping that the United Nations would support him. It was simply to legitimate something he decided okay. already decided fair to do. Fair enough. So I would not be, I would not pretend that they have a, necessarily an agency in something that's in the basic interest. We of have the discovered States. a difference here, and it's a significant one, and it will echo perhaps through our conversation not only between the three of us, but with our other guests as we bring them in. We're bringing in the first of those guests via phone right after some uh, impending commercials, and they impend instantly. After that, we will go uh, directly to Daniel Greenfield, whom I will introduce more fully after this. We are a little late getting Daniel Greenfield on the phone, but we'll have him shortly. <clears throat> Meanwhile, directly back to Barry Kelman, professor of law, uh, director of the International Weapons Control Center at DePaul University, John Allen, otherwise to his friends known as Jay Williams, who is professor of political science at Loyola uh, here in Chicago and has had a long and distinguished career uh, as a uh, naval officer in the Naval Reserve and also as a major student of war. Uh, this going way back to the time when, what was that center called, the one that uh, was founded by Maura Janowitz. Oh, the uh, National Strategy Forum National and, and Strategy Richard Forum. Friedman, yes. And Richard Friedman, who chaired it until fairly recently. Yes. Um, well, let's just examine right now, putting aside the question of whether we want any juridical basis for war or just call it war and declare it and do it. But let me ask right now, what sort of danger uh, might the United States be in at the moment? Where else uh, shall we worry about with regard to impending uh, Muslim jihadist assault? Everywhere we, we are vulnerable, which is to say everywhere. Um, and I think that that, I mean, we can use intelligence to try to find out where they're thinking of bringing an attack, but they only have to succeed once. And they can, with modern communications, modern transportation, 
they can wage an attack anywhere at any time and there's really no definable boundary and the other side of it is is that as we're seeing with paris an attack doesn't have to happen in the united states to have horrifying consequences for every american so essentially they've got the world at their disposal uh, one of their screamers uh in their base city said america is next well i mean the part of this is a uh sort of a edge of prop and it's the idea to frighten people and all yeah. that. Uh, America is actually much safer than Europe. First, you can't really walk here from Europe. Uh, much as we worry about the southern and northern and more of the southern borders, northern borders somewhat, you know, the intelligence services there are pretty efficient in terms of that kind of thing. And if they're Except that they may have many, many affiliates uh, in full place in this country. Well, they may Probably already... American-born. That's and very, ready to go. That's very possible. But this, the level of the issue, the level of the problem is much uh, uh, less here because, among other things, we've invested a lot more in counter, counterintelligence, that kind of thing. Our intelligence resources are better. Uh, and, I mean, the FBI is, you know, really good at this. And thank goodness. And it's harder to get here. And we don't have a large uh, and disaffected Muslim population that's unassimilated like they have in France. We are making a genuine effort to have a, a, a fair, multicultural society, and a lot of people are here for that reason. So I, I, I think the problem is, is easier here. I, I certainly hope you're right, but consider how remarkably easy it is to get AK-47s in the United States. We're, we're, if, there, if people are already here or even in North America, um, getting enough weaponry to do an enormous amount of damage not in any strategic sense. I'm not talking about bringing down American industries or uh, weakening the U.S. military, but killing a lot of people, a real lot of people. Sure. Wouldn't I, I don't see that there's a technological barrier. I hope you're right. I hope, well, I hope the I mean, FBI catches them. Barry, you're, you're right. We are awash in weapons here. Exactly. And that's a whole separate issue, and I suspect we agree on that more than they do about whether this is a law enforcement or a military right. problem. And it isn't just fancy rat -a -tat rifles. There is the possibility of, quote, double quote, low level weapons of mass destruction. Yeah. You can do a good deal with radioactive material short of making it into a nuclear bomb. You can do a great deal with chemical yes. weapons if you can get your hands on them. Right. Uh, we've seen uh, panics in this country over uh, uh, after just a few deaths from a particular drug that somebody was putting into envelopes and mailing. Well, the best people. example is anthrax, if I might That's say. That's the one That's I'm talking about. And, yeah. and yeah. Um, you know, killed five people in yeah. 2001 and set off in truly an international panic and yeah, sure. had the had dissemination of any kind of infectious disease is the terror that keeps on terror. Well, and young people aren't, aren't vaccinated. Come the smallpox vaccine, everybody well, in this room, yeah. is. If, we're not going to get smallpox. The young people will that, that we teach. Um, but uh, I, I, don't, don't, I want to be clear. It, we are going to be attacked. The question is when and how bad it's going to be. Well, the because, first time we were attacked, it was a major, major attack. Yeah. Al -Qaeda, very dramatic and very deadly. And those are harder to do because they're easier to spot because they're so complicated, even incredible. though we didn't do it. But these things have the advantage from their point of view of being very easy relative to organize mm -hmm. and with the weapons and all that can be done. But, you know, if someone throws enough javelins at you, eventually one or more is going to get through. And that's, that's exactly right. our situation. What then should we do, both directly for ourselves with our military and in concert with our partners in the world? I think there is a cancer in humanity, and it has to be it has to be wiped out. Um, there, I think we're talking about a very small portion of humanity, something in the neighborhood of under fifty thousand people, something in that neighborhood, and they have to be defeated, and they have to be disbanded, and different governments have to be put in authority over the space that they now occupy, and that's going to be a painful. Endeavor, um, uh, but it should be it should be undertaken because it will only get worse with time. At the other end of the continuum, there are those who would say, uh, Robert Spencer, for example, is one of them. He's written a great deal about modern Islam, uh, who would say that it's resident in Islam itself, not in all Islamic 
of a variance, certainly not in all Muslims, but it's there in vast proportion, a rage against the West, a rage against all civilizations that are not intrinsically committed to I, I strongly Islam. disagree with that of view. Of course you disagree little, with it. little empirical evidence for I'm it. just reminding you that that is a view that is held right. by quite a number of people, some of them also with uh, relevant credentials as scholars yeah. uh, or as military. Yeah. And there are those who are going to argue uh, the raps are off. It is now real war. Well, we've got to prosecute it as real war. And that means you've got to worry about a large civilian population yeah. who are also your enemy. Well, th there's two problems with that. The first, I think it's empirically not true that it is basic necessarily to any particular religion. Uh, but the second thing is it's not useful or helpful to view it that way because if you do and if you act based on that, you are going to have a self-fulfilling prophecy because the, the very Muslim population in this country and other countries that are watching and looking are going to... Uh, uh, not be uh, cooperative, not be helpful, and you may end up doing more radicalization than you have in mind. Plus, I think it's just wrong. What are the FBI estimates, or whoever gives the estimates, of how many American-born uh, Muslim young men have somehow got out of the country and gone off to join or do something in concert with ISIS? Well, I don't know what those numbers are, but in terms of... It's in the, a few hundred. Well, from this country, yes, but of course multiple thousands from Britain and France. Exactly. And a place so. like Tunisia... As like the first or second, uh, you know, in terms of the population of, of people going over there. And it's not that they go over there, it's that they come back. Now, Britain mm -hmm. uh, is very tough on this, and you can get your, you can lose your British citizenship for doing this, which suits me fine. But I think when they come back, that is very definitely a problem. Problem is, even though some of these people were on the French uh, security radar, it takes like, like 12 people to, to track one person 24-7, and they don't have the resources for it even though they're very good, you know. Um, in terms of strategic categories and ways of thinking about the nature of war, this is not an army against an army, no. whether mounted or in tanks or whatever. This is asymmetric war in the yes. ultimate meaning, is it not? Yes. Well, does... Not exactly. No? These people have territory, and they are fighting primarily with conventional weapons, uh, rifles up to small tanks and armored vehicles. Um, they do pose a conventional, albeit not very technically advanced, military challenge. Now, we don't have opposition forces on the ground, but it's really not, it's, it's not yet become asymmetric in the sense that, well, now they're bringing their attack, of course, to Paris. Yeah. That is asymmetric. Oh, I think it clearly is but asymmetric. There, but where they are in Iraq and Syria, it is not an asymmetric Well, let's threat. get a little bit... Uh, of technical clarification. What do we mean by asymmetric? Well, war? you talk about asymmetric, you mean forces that are opposed to one another, on one another that have different capabilities. Yeah. Only Saddam Hussein was stupid enough to, to come against the United States Army and other forces on open, open ground uh, and a conventional attack. Uh, that just is a non-starter. Uh, so uh, the, the, the tactics of the weak tend to be things like terrorism and guerrilla warfare and things like that. Uh, now, having said that, the U.S. has some asymmetric advantages. It's really useful to have the Air Force there and, and Navy uh, fighter planes and to have the control of the information space that we have and be able to have the intelligence resources that we do. Because the first line of, we have a layered defense, and the outer layer of defense is intelligence. And if intelligence is good, which it must be, it's going to be enormously intrusive by definition. And so the problem is, how intrusive do you let it be, and, and who watches the watchers? And I think those are very serious questions, because there are a lot of things that could be done that would be almost inarguably useful in this struggle, but some of them are very obnoxious in terms of other things, other values that we hold. If you were given to uh, doing public nightmares, what would be the worst possible case in terms of an assault that we might receive? A biological attack on a major city using an infectious agent that would uh, that would overwhelm medical capabilities to respond and the sheer terror of contagious disease it's not only the disease itself it's the fact that the person you're standing next to might be a car carrier you don't know uh, would cause horrific implications for for the economy and kill an enormous number of people is that now feasible it is feasible. There are controls against it. And part of the problem I have with what is going on in, 
in Southwest Asia under ISIL is here we have an area in which there are no controls. Yeah. It is hard to produce biological weapons. You need sophisticated laboratories, sophisticated personnel to do it. You don't just do it overnight, okay? Mm -hmm. But where you occupy territory, it is possible to have a, a place and have scientists in that place taking the time and doing <coughs> it well enough to accomplish. That's why I think it's so, it's, it's less important to be talking about the terrorists going to ISIL as the fact that ISIL is there from their perspective for a reason. They can't do this where they are. They don't have the organizational capabilities. They are going to Iraq, Syria to be with ISIL to learn those capabilities. Once we strike the heart out, then the others become individual issues of criminal criminality, but become much easier to cope with. Yeah, you know, all, all terrorist acts are violations of the law. The question is whether you're going to rely on the legal system to deal with it. I think that's a, I think that's a problem. Uh, you want, don't want to go far afield from things like uh, Geneva Conventions and such as we did. I think that's unfortunate. But I, I agree with Barry on the urgency of this and, and, and puzzled if it is so urgent why we would wait for the United Nations to get around to dealing with it. Did you watch or hear Obama's press conference in Turkey earlier today? I actually missed that. Well, I was teaching today. Yeah. Um, My dean insists that I actually work. Yeah. Well, he, uh, mine used to do the same. Uh, <laughs> But um, he actually was saying, well, the reporters were pressing. Some of them were fairly direct and, if not antagonistic, at least critical, uh, pressing as to, well, what are you going to do to alter the situation? You've got to do more than you've been doing, uh, more than we had uh, promised by Mrs. Clinton the other night in that uh, so-called uh, Democratic presidential debate. And he was essentially saying, we have contained them pretty well. This is a long and hard haul, and we have to stay with it, but we will not put uh, uh, boots upon the ground. That cliche keeps turning up, uh, but we do have air power, and that's very important. Yeah, but it's and, not uh, enough. Uh, but essentially, he says, the same as before, maybe we put a little bit more time and a little bit more personnel in, but we have to be patient and take uh, the trouble with the achievement. Well, I, I agree with what I sensed Barry was saying, that there is some urgency in this. And I'm are, saying the president didn't really represent it. No, as, no, I get as that. As having urgency. Right. I think that I think he's wrong to that extent. And the question is, what can we do that would be useful? There is no, uh, no constituency in this country for putting in a large number of army troops there and uh, in terms of actually having Americans in there fighting. Now, what can we do? What is our, what is our asymmetric advantage? We have... Uh, intelligence capabilities, second to none. We have the air capabilities. We have uh, various uh, 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 special forces capabilities. Uh, we could have, if you're going to put, quote, I hate that phrase, sorry, Mel, boots on the ground, because none of them, they're not wearing ballet slippers, because we got people there now. Have forward air controllers and forward spotters to help, help in targeting. Uh, there's a lot of things that we could do. We did that very well way back in Afghanistan. We did, absolutely. Yeah. We, but we have the, the army that we have is going to be supplied by Arab nations, I think, uh, or Persians. I think the president is right about that. In terms of large numbers of troops, look at how many Americans fell in Iraq only to have them throw their hands in the air and leave their weapons for ISIS to pick up. Uh, I agree with a lot of what you just said, but I, I want to take it a bit further. They are operating in a space in which essentially anybody who is armed is one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is civilians. And so we don't want to simply carpet bomb the area because they well, are I was not intermixed. suggesting that. No, I'm, I know you're not. I want to take the point one step further. I know you're not. But we have non-lethal weapons that we could be using that would not kill civilians, but would disable and incapacitate, frankly, the young men that we are concerned about. And then we could use military forces with much more safety and security no operation is perfectly safe. And when you're talking about 30,000 30, or so armed men, I'm not saying that it wouldn't be very difficult. But there are ways that we have of subduing, uh, th subduing this enemy. What do you have in mind? Well, I'm talking about, for example, there are heat weapons, there are sonar weapons, there are sticky 
hmm. substances, there are sliding substances, there are substances that in disable movement. Yeah. You can use these in a tactical fashion so as to disable opposition forces, yeah. force them to move out of their areas. Yeah. It would force the civilians to do the same, well, that but might at least be. they're not permanently Let, let me inter interpose with a basic question, uh, namely defi definition uh, of the term we. Uh, who are we? Uh, what we will prevail uh, on into the immediate future? What do we expect from, what are we likely to get from our allies? What do we expect from, what are we likely to get from quote, friendly uh, Arab nations? Well, uh, we have some uh, assistance from the, from the Arabs. They're going to have to be uh, putting some of their own forces in there. Uh, these trouble, these non-lethal weapons, is that there are not enough of them, and they haven't been well enough developed to do us any good for the next half a dozen years. So we're stuck with what we have. Um, the, uh, one problem is that we don't take war seriously enough. Uh, you hear a phrase like a surgical strike. I don't think a surgeon makes a surgical strike on your on your tonsils. There's always collateral damage. And so you have to know going in that while you're going to minimize it, it will exist. And if the values for which you are fighting is not important enough to accept casualties on yourself and to inflict casualties on others, some of which will be civilian, it isn't important enough for you to be there. Dr. Dr. Carlson, then, as president, would understand. He knows that surgical strikes don't really happen. Uh, oh dear! <laughs> something that does really happen is c commercials, and we're going to go to those in a moment. But before we do, something seems to have fallen through with regard to the first guest we were expecting. Uh, therefore, uh, it's time to open the phone lines and open the email. I would very much like to have response from our listeners. Your thoughts as to what our present national situation is. Your thoughts and hopes as to what should be done by way of counter. Uh, manding and uh, counterposing against whoever it is we're at war with? Uh, or do you not agree that this ought to be classified as a war? All of these are matters that we've been uh, ventilating over the last uh, 40 minutes or so. And we'd love to hear from you directly in response to any of those, whether in the form of opinion and, uh, uh, and special presentations you want to make or whether merely in the form of questions that you want to raise. So, at last, uh, the phone lines are open again, 847-475-1590, 847-475-1590. And, of course, email is always available, and we tend to get more email than we do calls these days. And the email address is 1590wcgo.com, 1590wcgo.com. Please get your calls and emails in instantly. We shall return after this. And uh, we are waiting for your emails and for your phone calls. We want to get the public in on this. It looks as if we will not have a phone guest until later in the second hour. So once again, uh, the phone number, 847-475-1590. Uh, is America more threatened than it seemed to be just a few days ago? What should our administration do? What should we be requiring of our partners in the world. Uh, these are the kinds of questions we ought to be addressing directly. At 847-475-1590, we want your views and or, of course, uh, your questions. And uh, for email, again, the regular email address is uh, 1590, or uh, rather, MILT, M-I-L-T, at 1590wcgo.com. I think I didn't do it properly last time around. MILT, M-I-L-T, at 1590wcgo.com. Do get those calls in. Gentlemen, here's a little bit of a surprise for you. Uh, je vous présente le président uh, de la République française. Ce qui s'est produit hier. What happened yesterday in Paris and Saint-Denis, close to the Saint Stadium of France, de France, was an act of war. C'est un acte de guerre. Et uh, face à la guerre, Le pays doit prendre and faced with war, the country must take appropriate un decisions. Acte de guerre qui a été commis par, uh, an act of war was committed by a terrorist Daesh, army, Daesh, a jihadist army, France, against France, against the values we defend everywhere in the world, contre ce que nous sommes, un pays against libre what we are, a free country that means something to the whole planet. 
C'est un acte de guerre qui a été préparé. This was an act of war that was prepared. Organized, de l'extérieur planned from the exterior avec des and with internal accomplices que that our investigation will establish. Un acte d'une barbarie It is an act of absolue. absolute barbarism. À cet instant, 127 At this moment, 127 are dead de blessés, and numerous people are injured. Et familles Families are sad and distressed. La le pays est dans la peine. The country is suffering. Et j'ai pris un décret and I have signed a decree to declare a three-day mourning period. Toutes les mesures All measures to protect our citizens and our territory have been taken in this context of the state of emergency. Les forces de sécurité intérieure et l'armée I pay homage to the internal security forces and hier, the army, notably for the actions of yesterday that allowed us to neutralize the terrorists. Et les forces de sécurité intérieure donc the Army sont and the internal security forces have been mobilized at the highest level of their capabilities. Veillé à ce que I have asked that all the security provisions are reinforced to the maximum scale. Des militaires patrouilleront en Military Paris officers will patrol Paris over the next jours. few days. La France, parce qu'elle a été France, agressée because it has been attacked cowardly, honteusement, odiously, violemment. La France violently, sera impitoyable will have no mercy against the barbarians of Daesh. France will use all lawful means et tous les and all means that are convenient on all grounds, et sur tous les terrains, internally comme and externally, en concertation avec nos alliés qui in conjunction with our allies who themselves are targeted by this terrorist threat. Dans cette période si douloureuse, during this si grave, grave, painful, si décisive pour notre pays. And decisive period for our country. appelle à l'unité, au rassemblement, I appeal au for unity, togetherness, et je m'adresserai au Parlement, and for everyone to keep a cool head. Congrès à Versailles, I will address Parliament at a meeting in Versailles on Monday la nation to bring the épreuve. nation together at this trying time. La France est forte. Et même si elle peut être blessée, France is strong, elle se lève toujours. It can be injured, et rien but ne it pourra always rises. Même si Nothing will le chagrin it, nous assaille. Even if La France, us. elle est solide. Elle est active. France is solid. It la is France, active. elle est vaillante. Et it elle triomphera de la barbarie. And it will triumph over barbarism. nous le rappelle. Et la force que nous sommes capables aujourd'hui de mobiliser, we are able to nous mobilize. en convainc. Mes chers compatriotes, Dear countrymen, ce que nous défendons, c'est notre homeland. patrie, mais c'est bien plus que cela. Ce sont But les valeurs d'humanité, et la France saura prendre ses responsabilités, et je vous appelle you à cette unité indispensable. Unity. Vive la République, Long live et vive la France. Republic. Long live France. Strongly said. I like it. I, I think that's an appropriate response. I find it kind of interesting, Mel, that you may recall a couple of years, a couple, few years back, when the Spanish train was, uh, was mm -hmm. bombed just before yeah. an election. Uh, the reaction was really quite different. I think the French, French are the wrong people to anger. I rather liked it during the Cold War that they had their own force de frappe, their separate nuclear deterrent, because the Russians uh, might have wondered whether we would trade uh, Washington for, for Berlin. But I think one Soviet toe stepping on sacred French territory, they'd have to wonder what the French just might do it. The, um, he speaks quite forcefully. He does. Yeah. More so than I gather he has yeah. acted with regard to the economic problems of France, but that's another matter. Yeah, separate issues. Yeah. If, if I'm, two things about, the, about his comments are really struck me. First of all, he referred to the, 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 the enemy as a terrorist army Plan the, plan the attack from the exterior along with internal accomplices. Mm -hmm. And I think a notion of this term, a terrorist army, is very useful. It mm -hmm. helps us think about what is that other thing that we are against to keep searching for nouns to refer to it. And I think that, that that's very useful. And then he said at the end that France would stand for the values of humanity. And I think that that's extremely important because here we are sitting in Evanston, Illinois, mm -hmm. 
And is it possible for us to say that we were not affected by what happened Saturday night in Paris? Mm -hmm. Is it possible for anyone anywhere in the world of any description to say that they were not affected by what happened in Paris on Saturday night? This was an attack against humanity. I mean, yes, it happened in France, and I can certainly respect the president of France making a special appeal because it's his citizens. I understand that. But would it have been substantively different had it happened in Chicago or if it happened in Buenos Aires or if it happened in Nairobi? I can go on and on like this, right? These are attacks against humanity, and they should be evoking from us a humanity response to, again, I eradicate the source of the threat. Well, this is going back to what something Barry said earlier that uh, despite some disagreements we have on, on UN effectiveness, um, th the fact that they have real estate makes them very dangerous because they can use that real estate to, uh, to uh, train, to attract various things, to have places where they can uh, do uh, various uh, maybe chemical or biological experiments, which means that. Uh, it was really too bad that the Iraqi army folded up and that we didn't uh, pre prevent somehow them from coming and getting them. Well, we are told that some portions of the Iraqi officer corps uh, are, are basic in the ISIL operation. Oh, they are. In fact, from the uh, Mukhabarat or their security services, yeah. the very basis of And it shows, again, how foolish we were after sort of winning round mm -hmm. one of the Iraq war. We then disbanded the army and gave them no employment and they found something else. I think that's a problem. But I think the idea then is, can you be content with quote unquote containment if that simply leaves them with real estate where they can cause more mischief? I think we need to worry seriously about rollback. It needs to happen as soon as possible. I'm not ready to put the army in, but there's some other things we need to do. Well, their, uh, uh, their caliph, Abu Bakr, has uh, announced that their intention is Sharia the world over. Well, yeah, I, you know, fine, but but I think we'll just worry about getting. They're losing real estate now; they just aren't losing it fast enough. But once they did that, because they had, but some they're serious, gaining it. They're gaining agents placed all over the world. Well, they ha they're metastasizing in numerous ways. That's certainly true. But they lost real estate in in that area. Yeah, and you know, the the Kurds certainly did step up, and we got well, the, the Peshmerga force did cut one of the three roads connecting. Uh, Yes. Uh, there are two uh, major cities. I also, you know, when you talk to military people, they're saying that there are certain bureaucratic constraints and such that we are not even having the most effective air war that we could have over there. And I'm sure there's legitimate concerns about collateral damage, as there must be. But I, th I think there's a lot more that we could be doing. Let me read you a, a few emails that have come in from our listeners. Uh, Jeffrey asks, uh, is there any benefit to calling these acts Islamic terror, as Mr. Netanyahu is quick to identify them, or to remaining politically correct, as Mr. Obama has? Although I find it refreshing to hear the truth spoken, I'm wondering if there isn't some sort of logic behind what Obama's reticence to say Islamic or Muslim, uh, whether there is some sort of logic behind Obama's reticence to say Islamic or Muslim, that I haven't yet considered. Hmm. Is there a well, logic to Obama's reticence? Oh, I, I don't know what Obama, President Obama's motives are, but I don't see any reason to pound that in. Uh, they, they certainly global jihadi terror, whether you call it Islamic or not. I mean, certainly the people- He has who are, never called it Islamic. Well, I don't know that they need to, and it's not like they need to be told by him that that is, who, that is the basis of what, what some of them are doing. Let them declare that they're Islamic, but I don't see we have any reason why we should uh, have to emphasize that. They all know it. I, I'm with Jay on this one. I think that, that the label here, every single one of us knows precisely what it is that we are talking about, okay? So the real question here is the one we were discussing earlier, which is, are we going to, if you will, inflate ISIL into the Islamic world? I think no one seriously wants to do that, okay? Mm -hmm. So if we use the word Islamic with the understanding that we are talking again about a tiny percentage of highly militarized individuals in Iraq and Syria that call themselves ISIL, um, and distinguish that from the larger Islamic community, I see little significance to the term, one way or the other. 
Uh, listen to this. Here's a news um, item from the Huffington Post, uh, just uh, posted this afternoon. The Interior Minister of France has called for the dissolution of, quote, mosques where hate is preached. Following a string of attacks that left at least 129 people dead across Paris, Bernard Cazeneuve made the comments during an interview on French television, according to a report by MSNBC. The minister has long been an advocate for addressing the concerns of the country's five million Muslim residents, particularly after January's attacks at the Charlie Hebdo office. But Cazeneuve's, but Cazeneuve has also made significant efforts to curb hometown extremism. France increased surveillance at religious and cultural centers earlier this year has been cracking down on supposed radicalization in prisons. Around 7.5% of the country's inhabitants are Muslim, but some 60% of prisoners are, according to the uh, 2014 report. France has also deported 40 imams. That's interesting. Hmm. France has deported 40 imams, Islamic spiritual leaders, since 2012 for, quote, preaching hatred. Nearly a quarter of these deportations happened in the first six months of this year. Foreign preachers of hate will be deported and their mosques will be shut down, Cazeneuve told l'Agence France Presse earlier this year. Marie Le Pen, now this is the leader of the far right wing major party. Marie Le Pen, the leader of France's far right National Front Party, tweeted out a hashtag that translates uh, to, quote, Islamic terrorists following the attacks as other leaders have urged for a reevaluation of the European migrant crisis. Nicolas Sarkozy, the former president and current leader of the country's main opposition party, called for a new foreign policy. He urged President François Hollande to rethink immigration policy and to tighten laws against those who visit radical websites uh, or travel to international jihadist sites, the Financial Times uh, reports. Sounds like things are stirring in France. Well, they are. There are much, many fewer uh, protections uh, there for several, several liberties. They're, they can do these things that we couldn't couldn't do and we don't, and don't need to do over here, whether some of those things are necessary over there. I don't but, think we've deported a single imam, have we? Uh, well, we put the blind sheik in jail for the 19... That was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. it was. Uh, but if they're in the business of, de- of you know, uh, deporting uh, imams, they should have thrown the Ayatollah Khomeini out rather than harboring him for all those years and so he could finally get a free ride to Iran and, uh, and destabilize that. Uh-huh. This, you know, they've been very inconsistent, I think. What? But this got their attention. I think one of terrorism's worst consequences, and, and I think the terrorists understand this and, and they want it to be a consequence, is very well justified but overreaction that gives venom to people who would use that venom much more broadly than the source of the terror itself. Mm-hmm. And that sense of repression from the hands of government mm-hmm. impacts terrorism. Mm-hmm. Uh, with that, uh, we are about to pause for the usual reasons and uh, time only to once again urge you to get in there with your comments and or questions. For phones, 847-475-1590. For email, milt at 1590wcgo.com. And we return uh, to our two guests in studio, Barry Kelman, professor of law at DePaul, and uh, Jay Williams, professor of political science at Loyola. Um, and now our, the guest we were expecting earlier uh, has, in fact, been located and is on the phone with us. This is Daniel Greenfield, who is a very active columnist for various publications, um, including uh, the ones run by David Horowitz, an old friend of mine, and is um, uh, the author of something called the Sultan Knish blog, which covers U.S. and Israeli politics and the struggle against Islamic terrorism. And I gather, Daniel, you tend to see um, the um, hostility of Islamic terrorism as somehow generic to 
Islam itself. Do I read you correctly? Certainly, that's the historical perspective. If you look back at history, this has been consistently happening. It's been happening long before any administration or before the existence of the United States or even really before what we think of as Europe today. You are going to get some argument, I think, from some of our guests, but lay out your own view more fully, please. Islam has a theological idea that uh, it depends on supremacy. It depends on the subjugation of the dial harb, the non-Muslim world. And as a result, uh, you have this kind of constant cycle of violence that uh, recurs over and over again, in which uh, Muslims feel that uh, they must express their religion through the destruction of the Dao Harb and its transformation into the Dao Islam. This is a historical process that has been going on for over a thousand years. We're just in one more phase of it. Well, on what do you base that? Obviously, there are some Islamists who uh, hold that view and are very militant with that view, and in fact, have turned into vile killers, and uh, they are causing a lot of stir in the world and have been doing so surely for the last two decades. Uh, But um, how can you, so to speak, tar the whole religion, which is um, numbers over 1.2 billion people, with that same brush? Well, you just used the word Islamist. What is an Islamist? An Islamist believes that Islam should be a complete and total way of life, that it should encompass the political sphere, and that's essentially the Islamic view, uh, which goes right back to the caliphate. ISIS has set up a caliphate, but the caliphate is not some sort of new invention, um, selling uh, non-Muslims into slavery, conquering non-Muslim kingdoms. Again, not some sort of new invention. This goes right back to Muhammad. So, again, this is historically, this is something that's been going on all along. Uh, when you talk about Islamists, that's, for example, the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood is the main uh, representative of American Muslims in America. When you look at organizations like CARE or ISNA, these are the main Muslim organizations. Uh, these are Muslim Brotherhood organizations. Islamists represent American Muslims. Well, those are strong assertions. I wonder how our two guests here I'm, want I'm, to respond. I'm wondering, uh, Daniel, would you advocate on the basis of what you just said a that Muslims are not entitled to basic human rights. Muslims are obviously entitled to the same human rights as everybody else under the Constitution. They aren't entitled to special rights, uh, which is really the subject under discussion. If uh, you, if anybody kills somebody else, if anybody uh, promotes the idea of terrorism or promotes the idea of murder, they're not entitled to any special privileges on that. I don't well, know. You get agree. You get much argument on that. We've treated them the same, I, and I. I would defer to you on your analysis of the history of, of uh, Muslim faith. I, but if you look at, frankly, any uh, foundational documents of most any religion, the fundamentalist version of it is, is pretty bizarre. And, and from my perspective, including my own uh, uh, Christianity or, or uh, uh, the, the is, you know, Hebrew, is, Hebrew faith as well. The thing, though, is that we're not just dealing with history, we're not just dealing with what happened 1,400 years ago. We're dealing with a consistent pattern from then until now, and it's, it has not changed. So should we infer? We're dealing with the same problems that we were 1,400 years ago. Should we infer? I, I really want to know. Should we infer from your from your analysis that uh, the people who, for example, are working in the Council of Arab uh, uh, Relations are are in fact also pursuing that same agenda willfully? Uh, some of them have certainly said that they'd like America to be an Islamic state. Uh, they've been vague on how exactly they'd like to achieve this, uh, but the organizations associated with them have hosted hateful speakers. And uh, they've had connections to terrorist groups, Islamic terrorist groups as well. But uh, Daniel, may I bring you back to, uh, on the basis of what you're what you're saying, what should we do? I, I gather you're not seriously talking about annihilating Islam. Uh, are you talking about subjugating it to keep it docile? Um, again, that's why I asked the question about about human rights. Uh, what what is assuming your view of of Islam, what, what is the rest of the world to do? Well, we have to treat Muslims just the way that we treat everybody else. Right now, uh, we're treating them special to some extent. We're right away rushing to say that, you know, if somebody, if somebody just anybody commits a violent crime, a hate crime, uh, we assume that there's something wrong with an ideology that says that's acceptable. Uh, with Islam, we rush right away to explain that this has nothing to do with Islam, that the Islamic State has nothing to do with Islam, that the various Islamic terrorist groups have nothing to do with Islam. And that's obviously not true. So we have to treat Muslims like we treat everybody else. And that includes responsibility, because responsibility is a basic form of respect. If you're not showing 
respect to somebody, you're not holding them accountable for their behavior. Yeah. Who, who is not doing that? I, exactly. I, I, I'm kind of on a practical basis. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, the administration certainly isn't doing this. Uh, they're refusing to uh, even basically talk about Islamic terrorism. They're refusing to even use the words. They're refusing to deal with the fact that what ISIS is doing, what other Islamic terrorist groups are doing, uh, comes out of Islam. It has Muslim support. It has extensive Muslim funding, for that matter. Well, I think nobody doubts that, I and mean, the people are saying it themselves. I don't know why, what benefit it is for the president to make a point of it, uh, as long as we're doing what we need to do to combat it. Uh, not a single Democratic candidate during the Democratic debate was even willing to use uh, the term Islamic radicalism. It's a so scary what? amount of political... No, really, so we what? can't deal with the enemy. Of course we can. We're, we're, no, kill, we we're killing them by legions. We got, we're droning them. We're sending troops over there. Uh, we're helping France bomb them. We are, you bet we are doing something about it. Uh, we're actually not doing anything. Uh, most of this is theater. ISIS has actually expanded its territory. It has more territory than it had before. Uh, 75% of the combat flights that we're doing is theater. Uh, no well, then, bombs are dropped. You, have, you no, have American pilots saying that they had ISIS fighters in their targets. And they did nothing. Uh, the administration blew it in, in Afghanistan. The Taliban are resurging again. Uh, they actually took a city recently. Uh, ISIS was resurging in Iraq. Uh, they're in Yemen. They're in, uh, they're in Libya. Uh, we are absolutely not beating the enemy. We're losing to the enemy. And, and again, then, what, what is it that you would be having us do other than make a terminological change? Are you saying that there should be ground forces in, in Iraq and Syria to defeat uh, ISIL? Are you saying that we should be taking different civil liberties measures or counter civil liberties measures against Muslims outside? I, I'm, I'm not following. I understand the term that you want, but beyond, you're saying that the term is disallowing us from doing what we need to do, and I'm wondering what it is you think we need to do. We're facing something that's a lot like the Cold War. Uh, we have an enemy that is attacking us on different fronts. They're attacking us in some cases as terrorists. They're attacking us on military fronts. They're attacking us on economic fronts, for that matter. So, for example, when it comes to economic fronts, we have to actually be willing to call out uh, the state sponsors of Islamic terrorism, including ISIS. Um, right now, uh, President Obama spoke in Turkey. Turkey is a state sponsor of Hamas. It's a state sponsor of a number of other Islamic terrorist organizations. And its government has ties to ISIS. It has ties to al-Qaeda. Uh, we need to be willing to speak out instead of pretending that these people are our allies when in fact they're funding terrorist groups. Well, I think it's possible, and I, I'm going to, I have some more sympathy in the way you're phrasing it in some ways. Um, it isn't necessary to use the Islamic word. I think if they're doing something that we don't, that they shouldn't be doing, we can call them out. And in terms of the, uh, the military forces over there, I think saying it's, it's, it's theater is, is sort of rhetorical excess. But, it, but you want to talk about what should be the rules of engagement. Now, there is a serious conversation that people, reasonable people could have and talk about without having to get, get to, into uh, other terminological mess. And I, I would add another question, uh, sort of piggybacking on that one. Uh, uh, quite simply, what's your reading of their current strategic uh, plan, if they've got one? Or what do you make of the events in Paris? What, do they, uh, what lies behind them? What do they portend? The Islamic State is, again, looking to stake its claim to being the caliphate. Uh, to do that, they have to conquer territory, and they have to terrorize infidels, which is what they're doing quite well. They've made it quite clear they're going to attack Rome, they're going to attack Paris, they're going to attack London, they're saying the next attack will be in Washington, D.C. Uh, they have to keep doing this because, again, Islam is founded on a theology of violence. It's founded on a theology of conquest. So to stake the claim to being the caliphate, to being the fundamental institution of Islamic life, they have to show that they can conquer and defeat powerful enemy forces. Um, I don't think your views would get any strong resonant hearing uh, in the present State Department, and I'm not sure they would uh, get approved hearing even in a State Department constructed for some coming Republican president, but I don't know. Do you find any in a significant political power in this country who basically might be taken to be uh, in agreement with you? Actually, in the current slate of Republican candidates, there's more awareness of the problem because, frankly, what we've been doing for the past few decades has not worked and it's not going to work. And there are more and more people recognizing that we actually have to confront the problem head on instead of playing word games, 
instead of pretending that it's a tiny minority of extremists and that if we have the right Twitter hashtag, we'll win this. We did have a statement from uh, Senator Rubio, uh, which showed up on television just this morning, in which he speaks of a, this as a war of civilizations. Uh, it's certainly a clash of civilizations. Again, that's an idea that goes back quite a long way. And we do have to take the historical perspective to some extent instead of being mired in this uh, last-second cable news attitude, because really this is a conflict that's been going on for over a thousand years, and uh, it's not going to fundamentally change just because we refuse to ignore the history. Um, last round, gentlemen, before we pause for some commercials. Well, I think it's possible that even those who don't accept or f fully understand your, your position entirely, but I think there should be some overlap in what all we do. Everyone in this room agrees that something has to be done very dramatically against the people who are doing such things. I think there might be more unity than one would think in our positions. With that, Daniel, I fear we have to cut away. We were expecting you half an hour sooner, but I'm glad we had this chance to talk with you, and I thank you very much uh, for joining us. And we will now uh, take care of some commercial obligations. And we return to uh, our two guests in studio, Barry Kelman and John Allen. We're expecting another guest uh, shortly after uh, the half hour. But gentlemen, let me give you some more email. Uh, Marcos in Lakeview. Uh, asks, do you and your guests think that this attack will change the plans to immigrate thousands of Middle Easterners to the states, as has been suggested will happen soon? I think the president just reconfirmed uh, in his um, press conference today in uh, Ankara, or wherever in Turkey that he was speaking, that um, 10,000 are coming immediately. Yeah, well, I, I, of course, some governors are pushing back on that, partly for political reasons. But uh, Barry, uh, the Kelman, the lawyer, will explain uh, in more detail than I can that these are not decisions that government that that uh, governors get to make. This is a national level decision, immigration and such. But I do think that uh, it is very important to vet the people that come as well as possible. We're talking about a manageable number. What are, what you do if you're Germany or uh, Sweden, that's almost overrun with immigrants. I don't know how they do it. By the way, is this a national decision left solely to the president, or can Congress take a hand in it? What's national? Congress could be involved as well. I should think so. Yeah, but it's still national, not state. Yeah, exactly, yes. The, but see, here we're seeing the, the spin-off consequences of terrorism. So instead of identifying the refugees from Syria as our first and most obvious allies, Mm -hmm. we, we perceive them as threats because it is true that very bad people can hide in a flow of refugees. And so our <clears throat> response, rather than talking as you did, Jay, about increased vetting and increased security against the few who would do us harm, recognizing our commonality with the people who are victimized by ISIL, we overreact to, to say, well, they are Islam, and therefore, many of them must pose a threat. Would it give you any pause that probably some 80% of them are male? Yes. I, it, I'm, I'm very much given pause by that because I know that uh, men are much more likely to commit uh, violent crimes. Yeah. Absolutely. And the need for vetting is, is unquestionable. And it's hard to do. Right. But our problems are nothing compared to what they've got in Europe because you've got hundreds of thousands of people c c crossing the border. And I don't, I don't really know how they handle that. But ultimately, these are refugees, and we must make common cause with refugees to enable them to get back to their land, which is where they want to be. Well, you don't know how they handle that. They handle it poorly. Well, I'm uh, not sure they do all that want to go back, uh, but I think that ought, to be, well, that ought to be the goal of public exactly. policy. You've exactly. got long-established resident uh, Islamic populations in the U.K. Sure. And, of course, in France, seven uh, percent of the total national sure. population. Well, and Russia has has in the Caucasus and other places. Kazakhstan are, is essentially yeah. an Islamic republic. And this is one reason that they went into uh, Afghanistan back in seventy nine. Yeah. It's one reason, although as far as we can tell, what Putin is doing now in Syria. But I'm but I'm not sure what it is that you're suggesting. I mean, uh, there's really no discussion about the UK taking action against its resident Muslim population or the Russians. Or, for that matter, the French taking action against their resident Muslim population. Actually, Hollande just today said that one measure he will take and that he advocates, or maybe he's got 
the full right to do so as president is to uh, take away the citizenship of any uh, French person found to be somehow in alliance or in cooperation with jihadist forces mm -hmm. without his specifying exactly mm -hmm. uh, what that would be. Now, the devil is in the details. We'll see what he does. But recall also that France has taken a hard line on wearing the, the hijab and uh, how women are supposed to dress. In schools. Yeah, yeah. in schools. Well, in the, the notion that these measures are going to keep France safe or that their equivalent would keep some other country safe, I think is just fanciful. Well, France has not been safe. There's been a great exactly. deal. Well, exactly. it might be counterproductive as well. I well, think you and I agree uh, on that. I, I would agree with that term. Well, Absolutely. Let's, let's There's been a great deal of individual nighttime violence against ordinary French by uh, Islamic French uh, for years and years, not only in Paris, but uh, in uh, a number of the other major cities. It's a, a pattern of hostility and shared distrust, which uh, rather reminds you of black-white relations at their worst yes. in this country. Well, Daniel well, Greenfield it, was exactly right. To the extent that Muslims commit crimes, they should be treated like everybody else. I think on that, well, everyone would agree. agree. Yeah, but you know, we have a nice, violent, not nice, violent streak among uh, non-Islamic uh, residents, uh, citizens. Uh, we tend to lash out at people. It, we, we used to be more racial. But uh, back when we were losing uh, the, ec the car wars to Japan, some mm -hmm. auto workers beat to death a yes. Chinese fellow because of the Japanese cars. Uh, I mean, so we're capable of this. There was an article today about a Muslim family in, in Florida that had somebody shoot through their windows. I and mean, this is appalling. And uh, we must do all we can to prevent things like that. Here's something absolutely uh, pointed for um, our uh, legal representative on this panel. Uh, mm -hmm. This uh, fellow uh, says, excellent and thoroughly timely program as usual. I thank him for that. Then he says, would someone peer into his crystal ball and predict if President Hollande will formally invoke Article 5 of the 1949 North Atlantic Treaty? So far, it doesn't seem that Hollande has done so. And should he do so, will President Obama's United States go to France's aid? And then he makes clear that Article 5 uh, of it, he says, the key section of the treaty is Article 5. Uh, its commitment clause defines the causes fideris. Uh, it commits each member state to consider an armed attack against one member state to be an armed attack against them all. First of all, I don't think it at all likely that, he, that Hollande will invoke Article 5 unless he has already made arrangements with President Obama for the it first... It says uh, further, this article has been invoked only once in NATO history by yes. the United States yes. yeah, after I, the I, September 11th attacks in 2001. Right. And that's when we had I, the Luftwaffe uh, defending the East Coast of the United States with American-made airwalks planes. Right, but the invocation of Article 4 comes after there's a military agreement to find to provide military support. All I'm saying is no one is going to invoke Article 5 as a shock to President Obama, oh, no. as somehow a choice that he will renege on. The arrangements will have already been in place. So the answer to the second question is I, I find it difficult to believe that Article 5 would be invoked and that President Obama would not favorably respond. Do you think he'll invoke it? I don't see any real reason to at this stage. Uh, everybody is on board. The problem here is mm -hmm. what constitutes the level of force that people want to use. Mm -hmm. And as long as they're talking about aerial bombing, uh, no one needs Article 5. We're okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, how on earth, uh, asks Greg, um, how on earth are we supposed to stop anyone from staging an attack? If they really want to hit, quote, soft targets, they're going to do it. There is no big project like 9-11. All that this takes is a handful of nuts. Takes well, he's hand. right. He's, well, he's right. And it's much easier to do this kind of thing, as they showed in Mumbai. And even the Washington sniper was a terrorist attack by yeah. Americans. Uh, but I, I, I think that... It takes a man it, with a gun. It does. But, you know, this is why I say intelligence is the first line of defense. And the fact that Apple is permitted to, to sell, it is legal to sell uh, apps that have encryption that's so difficult that even deliberately so that it, even Apple can't decrypt it, I think that ought to be against the law. And that's a conversation we kind of have to have. That's a we conversation, rely... but to suggest that Apple here is the, the core of the problem 
is is I think a bit of a well, a well no, but the core of the problem is that some people would rather trust themselves than the government, and they don't want the government to have the ability to cr to crack the code. I want to go back to the gentleman's question. Mm -hmm. And of course, it is possible. It is possible for an American to shoot up an American restaurant. Uh, again, guns are widely available, and they do. We've had many. Uh, but but to, to get to to get to the center point of the gentleman's of the question, I don't know who asked it. Um, the the hand does not behave without guidance from the brain. And when we talk about the Mumbai attacks or for or Paris attacks as well, we are talking about something which in its execution seems like it takes no great planning or great military, but in its planning it does. And we have to knock out the brain that is controlling these seemingly random, almost casual actors who inflict death. That's why I'm saying we have to go to the source and we have to perform surgery on that source. We have to, it is a cancer upon the planet and it has to be done as surgically as we can conceive of. But that is the way to talk about getting security. Well, one of the problems is that terrorism has become decentralized. You don't have Al-Qaeda planning from the center and providing resources and direction. It's not clear to what extent the people that did this got guidance above the state level. We don't know yet. I think France will probably find out. But you have a lot of uh, encouragement for lone wolf's attacks. Now, this was too sophisticated for that, yeah. but it was, it was uh, complicated but not sophisticated. I mean, you had to ha bring all the pieces together, but you're just simply using easily available weapons, even more easily available here. And, and, and interesting t to me is that there were like... Wasn't there like 1,900 people in that theater? And uh, what, 90 of them died there. I, that could have been so much worse than it was. But we must realize that before this all happened, we had a series of lone wolf shootings in the United States that had nothing to do with terrorism. They had to do with the insanity of the perpetrator. It's very easy to get a gun, and with a gun, it's very easy to kill a, a significant number of people. But I think we do have to distinguish those kinds of attacks from what happened in Paris or from what happened in Mumbai. Oh, of course. And we do. these take significant planning. Uh, and Hollande was absolutely right. This was a terrorist army that planned the attack from the exterior, only using internal accomplices to actually carry it out Saturday. Uh, gentlemen, with that, we'll pause for the usual reasons and then directly back. And in studio are. Uh, Barry Kelman, John Allen, J. Williams, and Milt Rosenberg. All three are constant admirers of Victor Davis Hanson, who's about to join us and who is on the phone with us, I trust, from Stanford University or someplace nearby. Is that right, Victor? Uh, today I'm on my farm a little bit oh, further good. away. Oh, good, good. Yeah. Have a plum on me. Um, and well, uh, let me come to it directly. We had with us earlier um, D uh, Daniel Greenfield, whom I don't, no, maybe you're familiar with some of his columns and uh, uh, writing on the Internet. Um, he um, takes the very strong position that this is intrinsic in Islam. It has always been there. This is the nature of Islam, that it uh, requires constant war when it has wherewithal enough to wage that war so as to essentially and ultimately uh, Islamize all the world. We're just in the latest phase of an eternal story. Do you find any credibility in that view? Well, I think that innate to Islam is a greater propensity for what you just described, but whether to the degree that it manifests itself depends on a lot of factors. For example, if you looked at the Middle East, and we, you and I had this conversation in 1941, we would say that it had embraced national socialism <clears throat> and was very pro-Nazi. If you'd said what is the reigning ideology of the late 1950s and 60s, we probably would have said they have a secular Ba'athist, um, right. Pan-Arabist. In the 1970s, it would be pro-Soviet, totalitarian um, communism. And so that area in general is prone to have or ma uh, adhere to a mass movement, but there is a commonality to all that, that people did remain Muslims and there was a propensity, but... I'm not sure that uh, 
people who are Muslims cannot be, I mean, they're, they're secular mus- secularized Muslims, if I could use that term. What stirred up the current trouble? Is there a sine qua non that one can identify? Well, there's a long and short term. The long term is that the Middle East, uh, for a variety of reasons, from tribalism to authoritarianism to anti-Semitism to misogyny, uh, to go down the list of pathologies, has not done economically as well as places as diverse as China or Chile or South Korea. And in the 20th, late 20th century, people were able to determine that because of the Internet and the interconnected world of cell phones and CDs and etc., cable TV. And there had to be an explanation for that. And the explanation that Islamicists came up with was, the United States did this to you, Israel did this to you, Jews did this to you, West did otherwise you would have been as great as you were in relative terms as you were, and then pick your century. Um, and that resonated with the underclass. So, and, and wealthy people, actually from bin Laden to Dr. Zahiri, were often the peddlers of that, as we know even from Hamas. So that's that was that prepped us for this start of radical Islam from nineteen seventy nine onward. And then short term is uh where did ISIS come from? I think it came from the vacuum that we created when we abruptly pulled out of Iraq and somebody had to fill that vacuum. And it's part of that turmoil. Uh it's been going back in that region. Uh since the first Gulf War. It's, they go from theocracy to autocracy to tribal to non-state terrorism to state-sponsored terrorism. Does it date from and our we, pullout of, from Iraq, or does it perhaps date further back to our going into Iraq in the first place? Well, I mean, pick your, pick your sin. Oh. Oh. If you and I had this conversation in 1956 and Dwight Eisenhower had a Fed, I didn't I'm up for re-election, and I didn't get us into Korea, and it's a mess. We lost 36,000. We have another 150,000 wounded. There's no end in sight. I'm just going to, when we have over 100,000 troops there, I'm just going to pull out. And had he done that, uh, that might have been very popular, but we're, <laughs> there wouldn't have been Kia and Samsung and what you see today. And that's essentially what happened. So was, was the Korean War the fault of Harry Truman, or I don't know, the Cold War, maybe, maybe not. But the point is, in 1956, he didn't do that, and we had a viable South Korean chance to evolve into something that we see now. So by 2009, when he came into office, the President Obama was in a regime, looking at a regime that Joe Biden called possibly our greatest achievement. He said it was stable. He said it was secure. There were nobody killed in Iraq in December of 2009. The accident rate that year. Uh, in the U.S. military was higher than the fatalities in Iraq. So that was a conscious decision, and it was a campaign talking point, just like the video exegesis of the Benghazi thing. And we paid a price for that. Victor Davis Hanson, of course, is widely known as a major military historian, as well as a very active and very pungent political analyst generally. Uh, You are, uh, in your last remarks, of course, talking about the way in which the Obama administration handled the situation that it inherited from the prior Bush administration. Uh, What should they have done differently? Well, there was a a protocol. I mean, there had to be a formality of renewal of status of forces agreement, but the Iraqis wanted to do it. We could have done it. And right now, as speaking, uh, what the Obama administration said about Iraq to 2009 to 2011, i.e. stable, secure, greatest achievement, that would have been true today because we would have had the troops there to put pressure on the on the Shia government to make it more inclusive, not to alienate the Sunni minorities, and uh, not and to sort of push back against Iran, Iran whether it's in their airspace or uh, infiltrating into Iraq in insidious ways that we pulled out. And not only did we pull out, it was part of a larger um, lead from behind, uh, asked Putin to help us with red lines, deadlines that didn't uh, really mean much uh, with the Iranians. I think there were five of them. Silence about the so-called Green Revolution, 
pressure on Israel. It was a general sense that the United States, under the Obama administration, just didn't want to be there in a way that had been a bipartisan consensus that if we weren't there, uh, you know, one third of the world's oil would be, and that wealth and the strategic uh, location of the Middle East, its historic significance, the nexus of three religions, that whole turmoil, Caldwin would be in worse shape if we weren't there. And now we're seeing that that's true. Victor, in your recent columns, whether the weekly columns syndicated by the Tribune or the many appearances in National Review and so many other places, uh, you seem lately, and not not just immediately lately, but for some time, to have been rather concerned that uh, we don't have much <coughs> of true cultural strength left in this country. That is, that uh, we're becoming a rather silly people. Are we so silly that we really can't handle the sort of challenge that we are facing right now from uh, from ISIS? Well, um, you take a campus like Yale University that created some of the greatest diplomats in American history, and you see that uh, they're dressing up like little children during Halloween, and then if that were not enough, they're angry and feel that they're tormented and aggrieved because somebody said that yes. they really didn't have to take offensive uh, Halloween costumes seriously. So I must remind you, that's my, that's my first job. My assistant yeah. professorship after I first got my doctorate was six years at yeah. Yale. And well, no, there's yeah. a, On our campuses, there's an adolescence. And when you have a, the African-American young fellow at the University of Missouri who's on a hunger strike that triggered that campus, uh, turmoil was the son of a multimillionaire who made over $8 million a year, and he yeah. said that he was oppressed. I guess what what the world looks at is that if our elite and our educated feel that they're oppressed with these psychodramatic and melodramatic contexts, then how are we going to deal with this pre-modern existential problems in the Middle East? Vic, Victor, We're right? We're so postmodern, I guess I'm saying it. We're dealing with a pre-modern world from a postmodern mentality. Victor, might, might you accept, though, that uh, adolescence on college campuses, um, first of all, is, is a phenomenon as old as college campuses, number one. And, and number two, uh, to, to go from that to an inability to confront ISIS, that we are somehow a silly civilization, um, seems like a, a bit of a leap. Well, let me just give you an example to address your concern about that. During World War II, some of the major decisions, technological, economic, and strategic, came from college presidents, Harvard presidents. Did you think that what the Yale president or what you read with the Amherst president's letter the other day, does that, does that at all resonate with you? I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not here to debate what college presidents may have done in the last couple of days. All I'm, all I'm suggesting is, is that to extrapolate from uh, such incidents to a civilization-wide incapability of meeting the threat posed by ISIS seems seems something of a stretch. Let me throw. Well, let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. When I should I should make clear to you, I should make clear to you, Victor, that that was Barry Kelman. You're in touch with him right now. Please go ahead. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. When Raymond Ibrahim edited the the Osama bin Laden reader, and he had the actual words of Osama bin Laden and Dr. Zawahiri, and he listed the reasons according to them from a speech they gave why they went into the World Trade Center. Why do you think that they listed among many of them that the United States had not addressed global warming or it had uh, not addressed campaign uh, finance reform? Well, I really don't know, but I think that, that well, if, you're, think if, you're make, right if, if, the, if you're right making... If, but if you're making an argument that somehow focusing on climate change is aiding and abetting international terrorism, I, I, I no, find I'm that kind that of preposterous. It, well, I, I didn't say that, but what, obviously what I was implying is that there are issues of concern and on American campuses, to the American public, to the American media, that uh, the people that we're dealing with don't think are very seriously, and they, don't, and they think that our attention toward those issues means that we are not concentrating on the on them, on the threat that they pose, and that they can resonate 
throughout our society by playing on that, and that's what they're doing. Victor, here is a, feel, here is Jay Williams who wants to get in. On Victor, if I may, uh, longtime uh, reader of yours and admirer yeah. of much of what you've done, I. I, I wouldn't generalize some silly things that happen on, on some campuses to be completely universal. I find some of this very troubling, as you do. Uh, my own Jesuit campus is, uh, has a very active and very uh, good ROTC program. I work with it. Uh, these kids, in fact, may be a new greatest generation. Some really the NROTC students I work with, uh, I'm a retired Navy guy, uh, up, at, up at Northwestern. And so... I mean, as annoying as some students can be, I think there's a limit to how much we can generalize. But having said that, American people have the historical memory of fruit flies too often, and we do not take seriously those things which which we ought to. And I think you're spot on in that. Uh, well, what? I'm, I didn't I didn't focus just on the campus. I gave some examples. I don't know if the other speaker heard me. I said that if you compare the attitude toward the Korean so-called occupation four years afterwards hmm. versus what we did in Iraq, and what the results would have been in, in each case. And then I've said if you look at college presence or if you look at what the United States media seems to be obsessed with in these incidents on campus, and then you look at these other existential questions. So maybe climate change, I'm not saying climate change, I'm, I'm not the one that says climate change has anything to do with the Middle East. People have made that argument. Bernie Sanders has made that argument. But it is uh -huh. strange that Al Gore ironic that he's up in the Eiffel Tower with a webcast talking about an ex existential threat when right down below him there really is an existential threat. And the President of the United States, not me, not you, not anybody else, has said the greatest threat that's facing the United States is climate change. May, may I push you and, on something that Milt raised earlier, though? I, yeah. I, I agree with you that uh, the the Obama administration leaving Iraq was a turned out to be a strategic catastrophe, not just for the reason you said, but also because the uh, the the spine stiffening that having American forces there would have had on the Iraqi troops would have had them behave much differently when faced with the uh, with the threat. But let's go back to the original decision uh, of President Bush uh, to go into what was really a war of choice in a way that the Korean War was not. And I wonder if you would, would comment on that and faced with, and I really would like to know, I'm not trying to be provocative, what do you think Bush's strategic choices were faced with what, what happened there, and uh, what, what should he have done, and what might have been better? Well, that would take an hour, but I, all I would suggest to you that I would, I took seriously what the Senate and the, and the House and the joint resolution passed on October 10th and 11th of 2002. And there were some very um, enthusiastic speeches from across the gamut, from Harry Reid and John Kerry. And oh, absolutely, I agree. The hypocrisy, Biden. and and they. Well, I'm not saying it's hypocrisy. They. Oh, they I, I'll for do 20, that for you. But yeah. Okay. Well, they they voted for 23 resolutions, and only two of them had to do with WMD. And the Bush administration, of course, I think in error, hyped those. But they were very. I mean, they said that they were getting twenty thousand uh, dollar bounties for suicide bombers that was disrupting the Middle East. They said that the Kurds were facing extinction. They said the extinction, the Marsh Arabs were being liquidated. The nineteen seventy pantheon of terrorists from Abu Abbas to Abu Nadal were residing in Baghdad. That all of the no fly zones had been violated. That this government had tried to kill George W. Bush. I could go on. There's twenty yeah. of but it, you know, So they said it's time to this is not a sustainable situation. So they went to Congress, the Congress, the Senate, Democratic members of the Senate and a majority agreed with the Republicans, vast majority of the House, large number of Democrats in the House. But they but, would have got a resolution if it had not been for Russia. No. They had so they went in there, and then I think that 75 percent of the American people thought that it was a good thing when the statue fell down, and then they had an insurrection. And of course, we know what happened for three years. But, but the, the from the benefit came. of hindsight, would you say that yeah. the problems were not just— because uh, I think there's three problems. First, the invasion itself, which was a mistake, and I wasn't smart enough to see it at the time. Secondly, uh -huh. botching the occupation and not realizing we're in an insurgency and, and then disbanding the Iraqi army. And finally, Ob finally, a President Obama leaving prematurely before the job was done. I, I think there's many hands on this mess. I agree with you, but I, I'm saying that, uh, just to quote Matthew Ridgway, the only worst thing than uh, uh, entering an unwise war, and he said this in 
when asked about Vietnam is, is losing it. So the war, whether we liked it or not, bad or good, Iraq was stable in 2000, latter 2008. It wasn't even an issue in the two, later part of the 2008 campaign. Barack Obama scrubbed his website of his earlier views about Iraq. 2009, 10, we wouldn't have had this conversation. Um, I mean, no, Iraq was on the black burn, back burner. It wasn't even an issue in the uh, 2012 because it took a while. Yes. But once we pulled out everybody, and then once we got, we did different, very different things in the Middle East, whether it was the rapprochement to Iran or the pressure on Israel or the uh, bombing Libya, by the way, in violation of the UN accords where we said we were only going to supply uh, no fly zone and humanitarian support and then lead from behind and then whatever we did proclaiming that Yemen was, a, I could go on and on, red lines, dead lines, step over lines, all of that in the totality created an impression that the United States either could not or would not do what it had done for the last 70 years in a bipartisan fashion in the Middle East. And so people, almost very analogous to 1979 and 1980, where the Carter administration made a series of pronouncements that nobody was going to die on its tenure uh, in the U.S. military, that we were going to adjudicate all foreign policy by human rights, we were going to sell uh, strategic planes to Saudi Arabia, but they wouldn't have bomb racks, et cetera, et cetera. And then all of a sudden, everybody nodded, and we had that honest terribles where they went into Afghanistan, uh, hostages were taken, the Shah fell, there was communist insurrections in Central America, even China invaded Vietnam, because there was a sense that, the United States was not there, and therefore there would not be an alliance behind it, and therefore there would not be a consensus of countries. So I think we're back to that now, and this chaos, that part of it was the Iraq War, but not all of it. Victor, and, uh, we, we have about four minutes left. Of, forgive me for doing this so directly, but let me do it all, but I shall do it all the same. Um, Olan says we're in a war. He said that in the Chamber of Deputies <clears throat> just earlier today. Uh, whether you call it a war or just an extended struggle to contain uh, somebody who wants to kill us, uh, what can be done, what should be done from here on? What's what's the strategic yeah. uh, picture before us? Well, I think the United States needs to get its NATO allies together and try to argue that they could have a joint, very intensive, aggressive bombing campaign the way they did in the Balkans. I'd use that as a model, because if each day that we, after this attack, we keep hearing there's new bases or new camps that the French are hitting, the question is, well, how do they discover them suddenly? They just pop up, or have they been not only known, but immune from attack in the past? So whatever we were doing, the French feel that it wasn't enough. So we can get our allies to do that. I think we really need to step up uh, support material to the Kurds, mm. and then I think we probably should beef up the advisors, people on the ground from 3,500, maybe to 10,000, and try to get our allies to come in there and train a large force with people from Egypt, the Gulf, the Jordanians. If we're there, I think they would participate and then move on the areas that are held by ISIS. And um, we're going to have to, we're in a very, situa- a very difficult situation because of the wild card now of Iran and Russia as well. But it can be done, I think. And so, the alternative is to do what we're doing now and allow these things to continue. And we've lost an airliner. The Russians lost an airliner. We've had these in, in uh, Paris, and they won't, they're going to continue. So you are saying, in effect, uh, we're in a war, then let's fight the damn thing as a real war. Well, we're in a war in the sense that 400 million people in Europe and the United States, 500 million, who have enormous technological, economic, military power, are for a variety of reasons baffled, frozen, confused, mystified by about 100,000 people in the Middle East, an area where the vast majority of people do not support ISIS. And why that is, I suggested, I guess it it drew the ire of some of your guests, that there was a psychological or social psych psychological or historical, whatever it is, there's a certain mentality that we can't or won't or shouldn't use that power to crush this group. And that's a decision that we've made and we can argue about, but that was a decision that we made. It's not a decision that was forced upon us. We've been in situations before, after Pearl Harbor or 
the British, um, after the invasion of Poland, where decisions were forced upon you, but we're not. We have the, we still have a lot of options because we have enormous power. The problem is that we haven't articulated the nature of that power. We haven't articulated how it can be used in a positive way. We haven't got allies anymore. And part of it, I, I agree, was that it was it's a long process of not doing enough in the 90s and then not uh, finishing the Iraq war in a way that it looked like it could have been finished. But that's ancient history, and now we have to decide whether we want to be engaged or not. Yeah. I, I don't th there's not a lot of daylight people. between us on that, I think. Victor. Basic question, last question. Time is just about out. Does our po po present politics make any difference in all of this? Does uh, the question of who will be the next president of the United States have any bearing upon whether we're going to handle this properly or not? Well, you know, that, that's a question that uh, I don't have to answer. All you have to do is go back and listen to a tape of the Republican debate and then listen to the one Saturday yeah. night of the Democratic. And you can see that it's not doesn't depend on what you or I or our guests say. People on the stage in the Democratic primary uh, debate had a very different idea. They, they didn't want to use the word radical Islam. I, I knew you were not going, to divorce, not going to uh, endorse uh, uh, Mrs. Clinton. Who on the Republican side appeals to you most in this present situation? Well, I think they're all... I have my... I, I don't think I could support Donald Trump, if that's what you're asking, because uh, I don't think anything he said has been detailed or logical. Yeah. It's uh, and I, I think Ben Carson, when you get into the second and third level of inquiry, he's not prepped and he's not prepared. I've got one minute so, left. You want to commit yourself to anybody? I think Marco. I'm most impressed uh, on foreign policy with Marco Rubio. Interesting. Chris Christie. So I started this program there, today. Three or four people. I started the program today with his statement as of this morning, of uh, 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 the rec recorded statement. Victor, thank you so much for joining us on short notice. And as ever, you. you've added uh, a tremendous amount to our discussion. And my thanks as well, of course, to Barry Kelman and to uh, Jay Williams. And with that, we're going to close down for the evening with you again tomorrow, directly after the news at 4 p.m. 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 News at 4 p.m.